From National Geographic documentary films comes The Space Race, the story of black astronauts in their struggle to break the bonds of social injustice and reach for the stars. Meet the pioneering black pilots, scientists, and engineers who joined NASA to serve their country in space, even as their country failed to achieve equality for them back on Earth. The Space Race, now streaming on Hulu and Disney+. You are listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books with anyone and everyone. While listening to my podcast, you will hear author interviews, behind-the-scenes conversations about various aspects of the publishing world, themed discussions with other book lovers, and more. For more book recommendations and a complete list of all of my interviews, check out my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. Today, I am chatting with Pung Shepard about The Cartographers. The Cartographers was an advanced read for my Patreon group. We read the book early and then met with Pung on Zoom several weeks ago to discuss the book with her. Both Pung and the book were a huge hit with the group. She was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, where she rode horses and trained in classical ballet, and has lived in Beijing, Kuala Lumpur, London, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., and New York. Her first novel, The Book of M, won the 2019 Newcomb Institute for Literary Arts Award for debut speculative fiction and was chosen as a best book of the year by Amazon, Elle, Refinery29, and The Verge, as well as a best book of the summer by The Today Show and NPR on Point. A graduate of the NYU MFA program, Pung is the recipient of a 2020 fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as the Elizabeth George Foundation's Emerging Writers 2016 grant. I loved The Cartographers. It is one of my March Buzz Reads picks, and I had a ball chatting with Pung about it. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drink ag the number one dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Pung. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. Good. I'm so glad you're here because I loved the cartographers and I can't wait to talk all about it. Oh, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Well, before we dive into all of my questions, why don't you give me a quick synopsis for those that won't have read it yet? Uh, Sure. Uh, The Cartographers is a novel about map making and family secrets. And it follows a young woman named Nell Young, who discovers after the death of her scholar father, the legendary Dr. Young, that this seemingly worthless map in his possession is actually hiding a very, very deadly mystery. And so she sets out to uncover both what this map and her father may have been hiding for decades. Well, this is the most creative story I have read in a long time, and I'm so curious how you came up with all the different ideas. So the first part is the map, the gas station map. My dad worked for Exxon for his entire career. And so oh, we wow. have a number, yeah, we have a number of those old gas station maps and we use them all the time when we were road tripping when I was young. So I loved that element of your story because it really reminded me of my childhood. But how did you set on that as the map you were going to use? Um, well, actually, so uh, there is a very interesting it's kind of unbelievable. It, it is a true story about something that happened with a gas station map just like this in the early 1900s. And 
I heard about the story about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, you know, in passing during a conversation. And the idea was just so alluring to me that I couldn't let go of it. And um, I I knew that I wanted to do something with it, but it took, you know, seven or eight years of uh, percolating to turn into what it is now. But I can uh, tell you that true story if you'd be curious. I'm totally curious. That was actually <laughs> going to be my next question. I'm like, okay, I have to hear what the true story is. Yeah. Okay. So in the early 1900s, like between uh, 1910 and 1930, uh, was kind of the rise of automobile ownership for Americans. And so map makers at the time realized that they needed a totally new kind of map. Um, because before that, most of the maps produced had been these really big, heavy kind of pieces of artwork or these, you know, leather bound atlases that you would use almost more as art and reference than as something that you could take with you. But obviously, those are not very good maps for driving in a car or trying to navigate highways. And so all of these map making companies rapidly switched over to trying to produce these cheap folding gas station highway maps. And there was one company, they were very little, it was only two guys and a couple of assistants. And they had cornered the market early because they were the first ones to realize these maps were going to become really valuable. And so they were worried that these really big companies like Rand McNally or H.M. Goucher were stealing their data instead of doing their own measurements in an effort to catch up. And they were really desperate to find a way to you know, protect their work from, from being stolen. And so what they decided to do was make up and hide uh, a little intentional error on the next map that they made, because they thought that if when their competitors' maps came out, if they could find the mistake on their competitors' maps, it would mean that the map had been copied. Because the only way that incorrect data could show up on another map is if you know they had borrowed the whole thing instead of done their own work. And so they made up a tiny town and they placed it in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York, where they were sure that there was nothing because they'd done their own survey. And they named it with a combination of their initials. And then, you know, they, they set about to wait. And a couple months or about a year later, Rand McNally's map came out and they opened it up and they spotted in the exact same place with the exact same made up name, this town that didn't exist. And so they sued, of course, and uh, they went to court and they said they'd caught Rand McNally cheating red handed because, you know, they had made up this town and it wasn't real. And Rand McNally said, actually, it is real. <laughs> and so, <laughs> right. And so they were they were so confused. They all got in the car with their lawyers and they took photographers and journalists and they all drove out a couple hours north to this place in the middle of nowhere in New York City or in New York State where, you know, they were expecting to find a field. And when they got there, instead of just empty grass, there was like an entire town with people living in it with the exact same name that they had made up that was a combination of their initials. Okay, I love this story. <laughs> so did Rand McNally run out there and quickly build a town? I can tell you what happened. I don't want to spoil too much about the rest of the story. but okay. um, well then don't. If you okay. feel like it's going to spoil the story, then everybody else can just look into that okay. or read your book and see what happens. You got to read the book, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Well, this whole concept of phantom settlements, which I guess is what you would call this town that they made up, is something so fascinating. Is that something that's common in cartography? Uh, it was for a really long time because it was um, sort of a foolproof way to prove that somebody had copied your work, you know. But there have been a couple of interesting things that have happened more recently as electronic maps have taken over as the dominant form of map making. Because it's one thing when you've got something, you know, like a, a dead end road that doesn't really exist hidden in a paper map that someone is not likely to go to that corner of your picture and, and drive that road and then get lost. But on Google Maps, for example, where there's an algorithm in charge of all of this. Things can get kind of weird. Uh, and so phantom settlements have fallen out of favor among map makers more recently. It, you're more likely to encounter it on maps from before the year 2000, I think. That makes sense. Because if you're using Google Maps and you're thinking, oh, we'll stop in this town and go to the bathroom and get some drinks, and then there's no town there, you're going to be like, okay, what's going on here? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, I also loved all of the details about the New York Public Library, the main building. That made me want to go visit again. Do you spend a lot of time there? Did you have to go there to ferret out all the details? Tell me more about that. Yeah. So I used to live in New York City. And um, so I have been to the New York Public Library. Um, I used to go quite often. 
And then recently, when I was nearing the end of the final draft of the cartographers, I had the chance to go back to New York. And uh, I definitely made sure to go in and walk the halls again and look at all the details and make sure that I, you know, I described everything correctly in the book. It's such an ode to the library. You definitely did that. Well, this is such a creative story. So did you have every element laid out before you started writing? Did you change anything as you wrote? It's a pretty intricate plot. So I would think if you made changes as you wrote, it might really impact a lot of the rest of the story. Oh, it definitely did. I think I have written more pages for this book that never made it in than I've written for anything else. Uh, I think my editor and I once stacked them all up, all of the discarded chapters and ideas that I'd had. And there's a whole book of the same length of stuff that we cut that wasn't working. So I, I think uh, I think what it was, was uh, this is the first mystery I've written. And it turns out it's really hard to plot a mystery <laughs> because that's why they're mysteries. <laughs> Yeah, so I spent a lot of time exploring because there are so many so many directions you can go with this. You know, maps are such rich pieces of art and history and science and there's just so much to them. And so it was a lot of work, but it was also really fun to just explore every direction that I could have gone. That's amazing that the discarded pages are the same length as the book. Oh, it's yeah, it was it was many many uh months of writing. Do you think you'll use any of that for a future book? Oh, that's a good question. I, uh, I I really might. Yeah. Well, I would think that you could go in so many different directions with this story and you include a lot of different things, technology, maps, the library, there's science, academia. So there's a lot of different things. I could see where you might go down one road and then as you're trying to fit it into the story thinking, okay, maybe this isn't going to work for this. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the difficulty early on because there was just, you know, there were so many of these directions and they all would have been really great. And what helped me figure out where it should, where it should really go and what would be the most true thing was when I started focusing on Nell and her family and the relationships between everyone in that cluster, because that was the most important thing. You know, the map, it is really, the map is very interesting and it's a really compelling mystery, but what the reason that the mystery is important is because it affects Nell and the people that she loves. Did you already know a lot about maps or did you have to do a lot of research? Uh, yes, I've always been fascinated by them. You know, they're, they're so beautiful and there's just so many layers to them. But for the book, I definitely did do a lot of research to make sure because I wanted the maps in the book to be interesting as well as historically accurate. So you have two different types of maps. You're talking about the older maps and then you're talking about this new online maps. And as you mentioned earlier, there are completely different things that have to be considered when you're doing an online map. And that can continue to change over time. Yeah, um, there actually are a couple of funny instances in modern history where when these places like, you know, these phantom settlements were sort of falling out of favor with map makers, because uh, electronic maps were on the rise, uh, but they, they hadn't quite disappeared yet. So for example, um, there was a place in I think it's Lancashire, maybe Lincolnshire, England, where uh, just a couple of years ago, Google Maps misread a phantom settlement as real. And so uh, it was this town that was sort of laid over another couple of towns. It, the, the fake town was called Argleton, and it covered this area in Lancashire or Lincolnshire, I'm not sure. So Google Maps thought that it was a real town. And so it started automatically changing all of the business addresses and the residential addresses in that area to have that town and like a different zip code as their address, which confused, you know, everybody living there who had no idea what was going on. All these businesses were like, what, wait, we're in this. What? What? That's hilarious. Yeah, it's been really interesting to watch these two different spheres of cartography collide this way, you know, because they both are you know, they're, they're trying to merge. But uh, when you've got an algorithm doing this stuff, it's you know, we always talk about algorithms being so unbiased and so objective, but in a way they, they are sort of biased just in a different way than a human historian might be. That's really fascinating. And I hadn't even thought about those aspects of it. There's so many different ways that technology is changing our lives. And that's just an interesting one. Where I see the map issue causing me trouble is like in my car. So when I bought my car, I have the GPS package, you know, it maps wherever it's going to go. But then over time in Houston, roads change, exits change, there's all this construction. If I don't pay to update my map, then all of a sudden my map is completely wrong. So right, then, you know, yeah. my husband just gets this car, new car, and instead of having the one-time purchase, now they just have like a monthly purchase. 
you pay a fee, almost like Netflix or something, and then it keeps your map completely updated. And I think it must be so interesting, all the different changes. You know, you think it's not that big a deal to move maps online and they're so helpful, but then the way it impacts everybody and what happens is fascinating. Yeah. And I think the way that we use maps now is really different too, because back when, um, you know, we all had these paper driving maps and you'd usually have, uh, you know, you'd have one person driving and then you'd have the other person in the passenger seat referring to this map and then looking out at the landscape and kind of confirming and together you would make your way. And I think we spent a lot more time looking at the real world as compared to the map. Whereas now, uh, if you watch somebody navigate with their iPhone, they just stare at their phone almost to the point of, you know, not realizing when the light is red or green and getting, you know, smacked by cars that are going by. And then they arrive at the destination. And then for the first time, they look up to see if they've actually arrived where they were supposed to. But they had no idea what passed them in the meantime, or if they had taken a wrong turn, they wouldn't know until it was already too late. I think that's exactly right. And I see that with walking too. Like when you're in New York City and people don't exactly know where they're going and they're just looking at their phone Mm -hmm. the whole time versus just, you know, kind of saying, okay, I go two streets down, three streets over, as you would if you were looking at a paper map. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's all very interesting. Well, we've talked a tiny bit about this already, but what was the hardest part about writing this book? Oh, um, it was, I think it was figuring out how to reveal the mystery in a way that that would be that would make sense to the reader and also feel uh, compelling to read because it's I've I've read a lot of mysteries and so I have I've had the experience of reading mysteries and I know when it feels good and when it's working but it was a really different experience trying to write one because your first instinct or at least mine was because this was the first time I've tried to write a mystery was I tried to hold everything back because that's the point of the mystery is a big reveal at some point, right? And so I got all the way to the end of the first draft and I gave it to my editor and she said, well, th- this is all really interesting, but I don't understand. Like, <laughs> what? We got to the end and I still don't know what the mystery was. And I realized, oh, she, she's definitely right. And so it was a process of going back through and learning when to let the reader in on different pieces of information or different clues that Nell discovers as she discovers them. Kind of dropping them in as you go so that slowly the reader is beginning to piece together the story. Right, yeah. And I also think that sometimes when you're writing the mystery, the whole mystery isn't even clear to you yet. And so sometimes the first time through, you're just trying to figure out what the mystery is. And then once you know it, you're able to decide how to, how to tell that story, how to let the clues out, how to, how to guide the reader on the same journey that you just took. This may be a really hard question to ask to keep it spoiler free, but how did you come up with what the resolution was going to be? Was that something you knew from the beginning? It's so creative. Oh, thank you. Um, I, uh, I think I did know that I wanted the book to end up where it does end up pretty early, but I did have no idea how it was going to get there until pretty late in the process. The one of the big reasons that I wrote the book in the first place was because I love maps so much. And I think a lot of us are similarly fascinated with them. And, you know, these days, when you open up a a Google navigation app, and you're just using it, it's comforting that you're, you know, basically 100% sure that you're going to get to exactly where you want to go, and you're not going to get lost. But I do feel like at the same time, a lot of us feel that we've lost that sense of wonder a little bit with maps because everything is so knowable in such intricate detail on a Google map that you, you know, you'll always get to where you want to go, but you're probably not going to discover anything new along the way. And I just really wanted the end of the book to have that feeling that when you open up a paper map, you still can find that sense of wonder and feel that urge to explore And like there is a possibility that you might discover something new on that map that you hadn't seen before. I love that. (laughs) Well, do you think it gets easier to write books the longer you write? I don't know if it gets easier, but I think what does get easier is believing that you're going to make it through. Because I, so I'm sure you've had uh, authors on that are, you know, meticulous plotters or very good outliners. They're really, there's really good planners. And my process is not like that at all. I'm, I'm not capable of laying down any kind of a, an outline or a summary or a plan before I start writing. I just have to make a really big mess and then find the story within the mess after I'm done exploring. And so when you do it that way, it's really fun, but it's also really messy and really scary because at one point your draft is just just chaos. You know, It's just a, a monster of pages that don't make any sense. They don't go together. And 
you're sifting through them and wondering like, do you, do you even have anything? Is this even a story? Can it be salvageable? And so I think um, it never gets easier to figure out what is the diamond that you're searching for in, in this mess, but it has become, uh, or I, I feel that I'm slowly gaining more confidence every time I do manage to find the diamond that, you know, the next mess of pages that I look at, I know there is something here. You have to trust your instincts. Just keep working. You're going to be able to do this. I will get there eventually. Yes. <laughs> well, that has been one of the things that's been so interesting to me about interviewing a variety of authors is that it's just all over the page. You know, some people meticulously outline and then pretty much just write straight from the outline. Some are in the middle and some are where you are. So it's just fascinating to see how people's minds work. It is, and I'm, I'm so jealous of all those writers that can out. I have, a, I have a good friend. He's a writer named Mike Chen. He writes science fiction books. And he is that meticulous outliner. And we just joke about it all the time because he cannot understand how I work. And I absolutely cannot understand how he works. But we're both a little bit jealous of the other's process because it sounds so different and fun. Well, exactly. And you know your process. And so it's just interesting to hear what someone else does to get to the exact same place in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you would never be able to tell from reading a book what kind of a writer that author was, you know, which I also think is really interesting. You have no idea if it was an outlined book or just a, a huge mess <laughs> until the very end. I agree with that completely, because I would think with a book like this one, where there are a lot of different things happening and a lot of really interesting kind of unique ideas that you would have had to completely plot it out. So it's fascinating to me that you could just write and then still end up with this story. Well, I think what ends up happening if you're my kind of writer is that the writing that you do in the beginning is your outline. It's just, it doesn't look like an outline. It looks like pages because that's the only way that I, I guess that I can quote unquote outline is to write through it. So that's why probably in the end, I versus any other given author who plans stuff better, I have more discarded pages than they do because I just have to do my thinking on the page itself, whereas they do their thinking in their head and then make an outline. That's a great way to look at it because I always think it's interesting. Somebody will say, well, it only took me three months to write the book. But then when you delve into that, they've actually created this incredibly lengthy outline or done all sorts of other work kind of building up to the writing. So the sitting down to writing the three months is truly just getting out what you've already planned out someplace else. And then somebody else will say, well, it took me two years, but they're talking about the research all the way to the book being final. So I think it's so difficult to really talk about those time frames and, and compare because it's really apples to oranges a lot of the time. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately, it's just the book took as long as it took me. Exactly. And it doesn't matter in the slightest, you know, yeah. it's like it gets there and that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. So who is the easiest to write and who is the hardest? Who is the easiest to write? Probably Nell. I think she uh, she kind of came to me right away and she's so singularly defined by her her strongest characteristic, which is her stubbornness. And so that was a lot of fun to write because she was just so, so herself. And it is always, I think, especially in a mystery, fun to write a stubborn character because they just won't give up. And uh, even when the going gets hard. And so it was, she was a good character to be on this very difficult journey with. And I think the hardest character, it might have been Felix, who is her love interest in the book. And I think it's because he's basically the opposite of her in many ways. She's really, really stubborn and, you know, kind of got a quick temper, is very decisive, uh, is always moving. And he's a lot more cautious and risk averse and more likely to notice something that could be a potential risk. But also then on the other hand, a little bit less likely to maybe take action right away the way that she would. And so he was an interesting balance because he was always pulling back when she's rushing forward. Yes, they were a good pair because of that. Yeah, they... Um, they drive each other crazy, but they also, um, you know, really, really work well together when they're able to see each other for who they are. Absolutely. Well, I have loved chatting with you about the cartographers. And before we wrap up, I would love to hear what you've read recently that you really liked. Oh, sure. Um, so I read, what have I read recently? Um, I recently finished The Echo Wife by Sarah Gailey, which is kind of a mystery too. It's a little bit of a thriller mystery. It's really interesting. Um, it's about a very ambitious, career-driven, brilliant woman who um, works in gene splicing and cloning or something, and then finds out that her husband, who does not work in the same field but has access to her research, has cloned basically a more docile version of her. 
and left her to marry the more subservient clone. It's really okay, a big that's death. creepy. <laughs> it's so <laughs> creepy, but it's really it's really good. So that's a great that's the Echo Wife by Sarah Gailey. And then I have also recently read The Violence by Delilah S. Dawson and Appleseed by Matt Bell, which are really fascinating. They're really sprawling epics. They're very different, but they're both so expansive and take place in one takes place in kind of a kind of like a mid apocalypse during a really, really strange uh, sickness that makes everybody it can make them like really, really violent, really dangerously violent. And they're not in control anymore. And then Appleseed takes place across like hundreds of years where, you know, at one point, humans are just starting to settle the Wild West of the US. And then in the middle, we're kind of where we are now. And then at the end, it's hundreds of years in the future. Uh, and, you know, the world has iced over. And there are pockets of humanity that are trying to bring back, you know, plants and animal life. Oh, that sounds interesting. Yeah, it's really, really beautifully written and um, really appropriate for right now, I think. Yes, it definitely sounds like it, both of them, with the crazy disease, except thankfully not making us violent. Yeah. But that apocalyptic story sounds like it would be fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're both really lovely. Good. Well, Pung, thank you so much for joining me today in the Thoughts from a Page podcast, and I can't wait for everybody else to read The Cartographers. Yes, thank you so much. I had a really great time. My name's Adam Sokol, and I'm the host of the Passions and Prologues podcast. Every week, best-selling authors like Jenny Jackson, Rebecca Mackay, Lisa Scottolini, or Brad Meltzer come on to my show to talk about, yes, their new books, but more importantly, the things that they're crazy passionate about. We've talked about the Muppets, powerlifting, traveling, gardening, home improvement, and so much more. We dig into why these things are their passions, how they inspire their writing, and where they came to fall in love with these random assorted things. Be sure to subscribe to the Passions and Prologues podcast wherever you get your podcasts and check out evergreenpodcast.com to learn more. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. Tell all of your friends about the show and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your shows. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman.